So for the final day of the class, we're going to start to talk about how we can add a database to our project, to our Android project. And this database that we're creating, of course, will be compatible with all the devices. Android devices, iPhone devices, etc. It's based on JavaScript, so the cool thing about it is that it doesn't need a whole server infrastructure. Traditionally, if you use something like MySQL, you need a server, and then you need a middleman, you'll need PHP to interface with MySQL. So your HTML uses PHP to interface with the database, and then the database does its thing, PHP comes back, and then puts it back on your HTML. So you need that. If you're using other kinds of databases like Oracle and such, that also needs a server. Well, we're going to focus on a database that doesn't need a server because we can actually run everything that we need right off of the device itself. We're going to use something called PouchDB, which uh, works as a plain old web app and also a mobile device app. So the database is going to be saved basically directly in the web browser. If it was simply a web project, it would be saved in the web browser, sort of like a cookie, but a big cookie that can hold a real database. And then when we get when we get it back to the point of using Taco again, and we install this on, on, on our on our app, it'll be storing the database on the device, on the device itself. Um, well, you say, I've got this device at the moment, I really like it, but I want that new device that's coming out in a week. And you move on to a new device. Well, we're going to release our apps eventually to the real app store, of course, and you will be able to download the app on, a, on, a, on any new device. But the database, uh, by default, that we created on and s started on one device stays on that device, unless you replicate it to a server. And then when it's on the server, that can then be transferred to any future device that you have. That's more to talk about later, but the point is that this database that we're going to use can work locally, it can work offline, it doesn't need any internet connection, or if you go further to the next steps, it can connect to, a, uh, to the cloud and have your data come with you. So what we're going to do is look extensively then at, go ahead and go to your web browser and go to pouchdb.com. This is what we're going to use, pouchdb. As I've said before, I've taught this class for about three years now. I've seen the evolution of this database because when I was tasked with creating these classes three years ago, I had to figure out what's the best solution to be cross-platform, to be the most open source, to be the most user-friendly, perhaps. And in the interim time, there have been many other solutions that have come out, but I still like PouchDB a lot because this is the database that syncs. PouchDB is an open source JavaScript database inspired by Apache CouchDB that is designed to run well within the browser. So you don't need anything special. You don't need a server. You don't need to pay for you know that server infrastructure. It runs right on the web browser or the device when we get it into the device. PouchDB was created to help web developers build apps that work as well offline as they do online. Because our devices are getting better and better all the time. This is a mini computer in my pocket. You know, people say all the time that what you've got in your pocket is way more technology than, than what got us to the moon 50 years ago. But the problems now that we're seeing is not the capabilities of the devices, it's the capabilities of the network. Whenever I'm in here, personally, the reception in here is terrible. So much glass and metal, and my reception is terrible unless I'm on Wi-Fi. And think about then if you're building apps let's say for lower powered devices or you're building apps for demographics that don't have great internet access so if our database was set up in the cloud and our app needed to reference that database and we have bad reception your app doesn't work and you get blamed even though it's the reception in the room so this one of the modern tactics of one of, uh, one of the tactics of modern web development and app development is a, the concept of being offline ready. What if you don't have a network? Does your app still work? Does it still have functionality? Can it still do something without a network? And when you manage to connect to the network then, does it synchronize with the cloud? So PouchDB is a great example of that. The people behind it, you know, I follow a few of them on Twitter and I keep up with the blog and everything. They're really concentrating on that, making a very robust system that will work in many use case scenarios. This enables 
applications to store data locally when offline, then synchronize with CouchDB and compatible servers when the app is back online, keeping the user's data in sync no matter where they next log on. The way that it works is going to be very reminiscent of things that we've dealt with before. It's all JavaScript syntax. And the way the data itself is stored is JSON format. So we see a very quick example here. Once we set ourselves up, we will be able to instantiate a new instance of the PouchDB object. So we, we haven't done a lot of like object instantiation in this class. It hasn't really been that necessary. All of the objects that we needed to use have already existed in JavaScript. You know, the document object, the console object, all of that. We haven't had to get very advanced by making our own objects and such. But the PouchDB object then is an object with a variety of properties and methods. It's all in the specification here. We're going to create a variable called db, and that'll be an instance of a database, a PouchDB database. To store data to this database, we have db.put. We have the put method of the PouchDB object. And we will see the various options uh, required and optionals but basically, we're going to store data into the database in this kind of format. Key-value pairs, key-value pairs, key-value pairs. That's JSON. And we can create all of these fields. Unique ID, name, age, height, last name, gender, etc. Any kind of data that you want to save, basically we can save it in Pouch. It's going to be in the format of JSON. We'll see further in the documentation. You know, we can make any of these fields that we want, like we've done before. But we're going to see the one, the one that is required is underscore ID. That's what separates one bit of data with 1,000 other bits of data. So to differentiate a record, Pouch calls them documents. To, re to differentiate a document in the database, it needs a unique underscore ID in that format. And that can be anything. Like in this case, it's an email address. It can be a timestamp. It can be a randomly generated number, something. And in this case, this is saving a user to the database. It's using the email as a unique identifier, just like a real social network where that one email differentiates you from everyone else. And if you try to use an email that's already been used, it won't let you. Well, here, the unique ID is an email. The second piece of data of this one document, or record, is name, David, and then age, a number. So we can have strings, we have numbers, true, we can have objects, etc. But it's all basically a string. We'll have db.changes. So if we've got a change to the database, this is pay attention to changes in the database on change. So if there's a change to the database, we can have various callback functions. In this case, just a quick console output that the database has changed. But theoretically, what could happen is when there's a change to the database, use the built-in methods to then copy the changes to the server. And that's going to be something like db.replicate.2. We're going to copy our database over to some online infrastructure, some server. We have replicate to, we have replicate from. So it goes on to say that it works on all the browsers and mobile devices. It's, it's lightweight. It doesn't, again, require a whole server with hundreds of megabytes of setup. It's a 46 kilobyte zipped file. Easy to learn because it's based on JavaScript. You learn a few methods and such. It's open source. So you can keep up with the development and contribute to the development. So if you find bugs and such, you can help fix those bugs and improve the, the project. Um, version 6 was released recently. Version 5. The people, behind Couch, uh, the people behind Pouch are really cool. I follow Nolan Lawson over here. He's very up-to-date with what's going on in the project and answers questions. Keep up to date with them on Twitter and all of that, learn how it works, contribute, etc. 
Well, what we will do is let's go take a quick look at learn more here. Back at the top, learn more. We're not going to read every bit of the documentation just yet, but um, so it's an in-browser database that allows apps to save data locally so that the users can enjoy all the features of an app even when they're offline. Plus the data is synchronized between clients so users can stay up to date. It runs on Node.js, couch compatible server, browser support, it works on all the browsers from these versions up, and mobile devices, so you need Android 4 and up, iOS 7 and up. Although if you really wanted to target older versions of iOS, you can use an older version of Pouch. Currently it's at 6.07. Uh, it works great also with Cordova slash PhoneGap slash Taco projects, which is what we've got. Looking at quickly at download, it tells you how to download it. It's a it's either a file or connect to the connect to the CDN. That's all informational. Don't worry about that. Who's using Pouch? Uh, just examples of other companies that have used it. So use case scenarios for you to see, um, you know, how this can be used for you. You know, create the next Pokemon app with it. Story. Uh, on the flips, on the opposite side of that, there's a very good uh, project going on trying to stamp out Ebola and such using this as saving the data to to track inoculations and such. Yes. It's going to say here somewhere. Um, we'll see it here somewhere. Um, API maybe. I know I've seen it recently. If you guys find it, it's going to be in here somewhere. And it says. Um, it's somewhat dependent on the device that you're on, but uh, often it's like the minimum level is often about 100 megabytes. So a 100 megabyte database is huge because a database, as we've seen, is basically text. It's not that we're storing the actual picture in the database. We're storing a reference to the picture from the memory card. So a 100 megabyte database, and you can create multiple instances of them. So you can have one database of 100 megs here and another database, DB2, of another 100 megs if you wanted. But it's going to depend on the device, and somewhere here we will see specific specifics. Somewhere here. There's a video tutorial um, to get you kind of started off. You can look at that at some point. The API, so all the documentation. Here's the whole documentation, how exactly it works. We'll look at that soon. Adapters, don't worry about that just yet. Custom builds, don't worry about that. Plugins, don't worry. Okay, FAC, we'll probably find the FAC answer in here. Uh, can PouchDB sync with MongoDB, MySQL, or another non CouchDB? No, your backend needs to speak CouchDB replication protocol. So, this is one of the first questions that people always ask. I've already got a server and it runs MySQL. Can my can pouch whatever we're going to create here connect to my SQL database? No. There are different languages, different ways to do a database. This one is more of the no SQL style of modern databases, which doesn't require the server. Although there are plugins, there are people that have made a plugin to try to do a translation. Out of the box, no, you won't be able to connect this database with your my SQL database. But with the right plug-in and a bit more elbow grease, you can do it. It can connect to a couch DB style database running on a server, which you would then need to learn how that works if you want to use that. So you might say, well, why don't we use MySQL? Again, we need a server. We need a whole infrastructure and all of that. And depending on your kind of app, that may be overkill at this point. So we've used this before for several classes and it works pretty well. What can it uh, sync with? And it goes on there. You can click to get more details. Can you build a native app? Yes, definitely. More links there. How much, here we go, how much data can it store? So if you're using Firefox, 50 megabytes to start off with, which can be added more to it. Chrome, uh, based on the user's hard drive. So if I've got a one terabyte hard drive, it's going to store a terabyte of data if I'm using Chrome. 
if you're on Opera, similar Internet Explorer, it's got a limit of 250 megabytes, uh, and then it will ask for 10 megs more at a time. Safari, etc. What about iOS? Fifty megabytes. Android can store up to two hundred megs per instance of the database, so you can make more than one database. But again, you're not going to be putting the raw data of your photos in this database. You could, you shouldn't. Just like a real database, you're not really putting that JPEG in the MySQL database. You shouldn't. It's too much raw data. You're putting references to the picture somewhere on the folder structure. What types? Uh, documents and attachments. That'll make sense as we go on. A document, uh, they are serialized as JSON. Um, attachment support, which are the most efficient way to store binary data. So if you actually want to do real binary data, uh, like the actual graphic, it's going to be a base64 encoded string or a blob object. Works on all of these things. What about upgrading? What's the difference between couch and pouch? You can look at that on your own. Okay, so if I go over to the guides are nice, but let's jump into the API. In the API, here's then a list of all the things you can do. You can create a database fetch a document, uh, create or store a document, delete documents, how to deal with synchronization and attachments and such. Just like any good database, it's create database, add documents, retrieve documents, delete or update documents, delete the database, this is just like every other database out there. Uh, PouchDB has an asynchronous API, there's callbacks, so most of the time you do something you often give it arguments, and then you have optional options and callbacks. What's the result of saving my data? Oftentimes the result is either a positive result that it did save, or a negative result that it didn't save. So we have callbacks to deal with what happened if you properly saved, make a pop-up that says saved. What happens if it didn't save, make a pop-up that says error. So we have callbacks. It also uses promises. How many of you are familiar with promises? in web development. I can't raise my hand too much either because that's another thing that I need to also educate myself on. This is like the next cutting-edge generation of JavaScript promises. Callbacks are the traditional method. We've all had experience in it in this class if I have not explicitly said it over and over, but we've been using callbacks, a result of a JavaScript method. Promises are like the newer version. They're they're not they're not fully implemented on all browsers yet, but it's just another way to deal with results of save of doing an action in JavaScript. It's got a certain kind of syntax which doesn't seem that complicated, but again, when I find that time that I lost under the couch, I'm going to get in there and start to get more educated in some of this stuff. Create a database, so all of that's there. It's basically new pouch options, even the name of the database is optional. And so the documentation will be like this, that there will be a command, a bit of explanation, what kind of options we have, and then oftentimes an example. Okay, uh, let's set it right here, example usage, okay, under here, here's creating a local database in our device, here is creating a database on a server. Elsewhere in the documentation, it tells you how to set up the server. But we can connect to the server at the right port with credentials and such. Deleting the database is object, the object database dot destroy method. Various options and examples. Okay, documents. Create a new document or update an existing document. If the document already exists, you must specify a revision, otherwise conflicts will occur. So we'll see later that, let's say we're going to save something to the database. A little bit of data about myself, first name, last name, birth date. 
And I want to save it that um, I changed, I legally changed my name. So I need to update that, that document, that record. Well, we'll be able to make changes to our database, of course. And the way that we can keep track of changes is a revision field will be used to keep track of the changes of the data. So here it shows db.put. It's in JSON format because it's got the curly braces. It's got the required underscore ID with some unique identifier. And then whatever fields we want to make up. For example, title. The documentation often shows you here in the format of promises, callbacks, or asynchronous functions. In this class, we're going to work with callbacks because, again, I said I don't have enough of a knowledge to be comfortable to teach you how to use promises if myself I'm not quite comfortable yet with that. So if you're looking at any of this documentation, perhaps switch it over to callbacks, which is what we're familiar with at, the, at this point. db.put, put the data in, comma, there's a callback function with some sort of error, negative, some sort of response, positive deal with those results, if else statements, other function callbacks, etc. to deal with the positive or the negative result. We're going to see later on if we want to make a change. We want to make a change. This used to be called Heroes. The title of this song was Heroes. We're then going to change it to Let's Dance. Well, in order to <clears throat> make a change to a document that already exists, we also need to provide an underscore rev in that format, there has to be a field. If we're going to update an existing record, an existing document in the database, we need a new revision number. We'll get to that later. <clears throat> if we do console output and such, we're going to get some sort of JSON object with the, these various fields. OK of true, an ID of our object, and a revision. This. 64-bit, 64-character uh, 64 revision number keeps track of the changes of in your data. There's post, there's fetch, get the data from the database, delete a document, and remember our terminology of document is one record of a database. For example, last name, first name, birthday, height, gender, all of that, five pieces of data would be stored under one JSON object, which would be a document in PouchDB. So creating, uh, creating or delete or updating a bunch of documents at once, we can see that. So all the documentation is here again. We're not going to read it all at this point. Uh, we're going to start to set ourselves up to start the, the basic foundation of what I want to use this for. I want to use PouchDB eventually when we get back to our MySDCE app. The app at this point shows a list of classes. It has a map to the campus. It has a little calendar. But what I wanted to do functionality-wise is I want the user, I want the student to make a list of all classes that they intend to take or have taken. You know, save data about um, about these classes, um, records for, for classes they will take or have taken, and so forth. An educational plan. I want to save that. I want the user to be able to save that into their app. So we need a database. That's where PouchDB comes in. We're going to start the basic skeleton uh, before bringing it into our main app, just so that we understand how it works, and then we'll incorporate it into our main app. Any questions about Pouch so far before we actually start to write some code? Okay, I have a starting point for us. If you go into the network folder, get a copy of PouchDB Start. Get that whole folder, copy that to your flash drive, and put today's date on it. We're going to work on this for a couple of times. I don't expect to finish this today. We'll probably work on it today and day one of next month, and then a little bit more. And We'll see. But copy that to your flash drive and put today's date on it. So I copied that to my flash drive with today's date.
what I've given you in that folder is the jQuery library and the pouch library. The way pouch works is we write HTML and JavaScript and we use the various objects and methods and properties that are available to us with this library. We never need, really need to look inside of that file. It's, you know, it's a black box, we just need to know how to use it. Just like jQuery. The point of jQuery is that it allows us to write many JavaScript shortcuts. Instead of writing document.getElementById, we write dollar symbol parentheses. Same thing. So, we're going to create an HTML file, very basic one again, and then we're going to start to set up an input form to accept the input and then save it to the database and all of that. So from this folder, I'm going to do right-click new text document. Rename that to pouchdb.html. I'm going to open up pouchdb.html in um, Notepad and start writing my basic 10-line HTML file again. and put references to the jQuery and the pouch libraries. So after you rename pouchdb, make sure it's .html, of course. It'll complain, but make sure you rename it to .html. Edit that in Notepad. We'll do the usual here. Doc type HTML, HTML, slash HTML, head, head body, Meta car set. Title, let's say here, uh, pouch db. Hang one, pouch db practice. I'm going to write a lot of JavaScript, so we'll start our script tag there. Eventually, when we incorporate this into our main app, we will separate out the script stuff into the script file, but for the moment, we'll keep it incorporated. And here, so we're going to do this eventually. So we'll do those 13 lines there, and then we'll start to write the libraries. Get everyone get a help a hold of the, the sign-in sheet. Above my um, in um, above my embedded HTML uh, script JavaScript block, I'm going to put here script again. This then will be um, our script tag to link to the jQuery file and the pouch file. So we have src equals quotes. And the name of our jQuery file in the folder, which is jQuery one.11.3.min.js. That's the same one that I got out of our project from my SDCE. So we're going to use jQuery in our project. We don't have to, but since we have jQuery on our main MySDCE project, and jQuery helps us with a lot of shortcuts, we might as well start using it at this point as well. And um, I may have mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again. We have to have a script 
pair that references the script file on its own. We could not borrow this existing one and add source to it. It's either or. So there's nothing between the script tags here. We will not write any JavaScript in between that. We only need the script tags, in this case, to connect to that library. After that, I'm going to need another script tag to then connect over to the pouchdb file. That one is called pouchdb 607minjs pouchdb 6.0.7.min.js. It's the minified. Both of those are the minified versions. Eventually, what we're creating here will look nice when we bring it into our main project, which has got jQuery Mobile, which is a way for us, of course, to uh, create a pretty interface. Right now, it's going to look very basic. We don't need it to be very fancy at this point. We just need it to work. Personally, myself, when I, when I create some kind of app, it looks ugly for a long time because I simply want the, the logic of it to work. The, the algorithm to work, and then I focus on starting to make it look nice. So this won't look that nice. What we're going to do then, back in, back before any of our scripts here, we're going to create then a form. We're going to have an input form to collect a few bits of data from the user, and then we're going to have a div after that to display the data, because they're going to save various items of a class and they're going to want to retrieve that information eventually so we need something for input we need something for output the form we will give an ID so we can reference it easily in JavaScript and we can call this form class this is our form to save classes. And then our div here, we'll give that an ID as well. We'll call that div, uh, div show. This is where we will show results. This can be named anything we want, of course, if we, <coughs> if we remember what we called it. Inside of the form, we will create a label. We're going to have input fields, and we need a label for them. Label for, we'll call this field CRN. I'll explain that in a moment. Which then an input of type text oh uh, between the labels here we need CRN CRN colon space so we're gonna have an input field of type text and next to it the word CRN will appear so what we're gonna do is all of our classes that we offer at this college have you know, three important things about them. Who's teaching the class? What is the unique CRN number that identifies the class? And what is the title of the class? So we're going to ask the user, type in a CRN number for the class in this input box. This input further uh, needs a name, which is the same name as field CRN. The label that we wrote a moment ago here, this label is used for this input box, so they match up there with their names. And then we'll also give an ID of the same thing, field CRN. ID field CRN. So 
lastly, I want to add a placeholder to the input field to sort of guide the user what they're expected to type. And I want to add this before ID, which again, IDs in classes, I like to leave them as the very last item. Actually, also names. Names and IDs, which are unique ways to identify an element, I like to leave those as the last things so I can find them quickly. So we'll back up here to add placeholder. Placeholder text will appear in the box. And just the, the CRN, just for something to put in of this class, is 1828J. So I'm expecting the user to type some unique number of a class like that. If you save and run it, take a quick look at it, you'll get an input box with the word CRN next to it. That's what's expected for them to type. Uh, we're going to run this in, uh, in Chrome. I, I see that it's a little better to kind of work with and troubleshoot and test and such. Uh, Firefox should work okay, but I'm going to go with Chrome. So let me just get something like that. The user will be asked for a CRN. It looks something like that. They're going to type it in, plus the, uh, plus the class name and the instructor's name, and then submit. So we're going to create an, a form here. Next, we will say, <clears throat> at the end of that line, break. So on the next line, <clears throat> something very similar. Let's save ourselves some effort here. I'm going to copy and paste that whole line there because I need to create another label, another input. I need to change the details, of course, and this may be a fast way to do it or not. And I'm going to say now I'm going to need C uh, field name. This is the name of the class. So I'm going to say type the name of the class here the for field name. I'm going to reuse that for the name attribute and the ID attribute. Placeholder, I'll say Android 1. The user can type any name of a class here. And in the name, field name, and the ID, field name. This is the input field where the user is typing the name of the class. Same thing, next line. I need to create another input, another field. Uh, I'll do this one, I-N-S-T, instructor. We can type instructor, but it's more to type, so we can keep it short if you remember what we called it. This is a field to take the instructor's name, who's teaching the class. So we're saving What's the unique identifier of the class? What's the name of the class? What's the instructor of the class? Placeholder. You know, we can put anything we want there. Just put a last name. First name, last name. They can type anything they want, but put a last name. And then the name, of course, is the same as the four, and the ID is the same as the four. All of them are using field inst. We're going to make it look nicer and align it and all that cool stuff later. But we've got these input boxes now, CRN name instructor. We then need a save button. 
and a clear button, a button to clear it if I'm making a mistake and I want to start over. So on the next line, this one does not need a label. It's going to be an input of type reset. This will be a button that will reset the form. Value attribute, which is what we display in the button itself. Um, let's say reset. This will reset the form. If we need to reference it to make it do more than simply reset the form via JavaScript, let's give that an ID. Call this btn reset. Space. And then we'll put in our next one, input of type. This one will be a generic button. Um, value save. So value is the text that appears on the button's face. We'll do save. And uh, an ID. And that'll be here, btn save. So these IDs and classes and all of that, we can of course name them whatever we want, whatever makes sense to us. I find sort of like prefixing them with what it is helps me remember what I named them. This is a button, that's the button save. I have a reset button, so it's btn reset. I have, an, I have a field for the CRN, I have a field for the instructor, so I call it field inst. Save it and run it. This doesn't do anything yet, of course. We've got input fields, buttons, and then through extensive JavaScript, we'll actually make it work. There we go. We can type. At the moment, we don't have any sort of data uh, checking. But the reset button should work. If you type anything and reset, it should work. And then the save button doesn't do anything yet. We haven't programmed that yet, but we're setting ourselves up, and I don't believe anything should happen in the console yet. We'll be looking at our console output a lot, of course. Nothing seems to be happening there yet. This is what we have at this point. Simple form and this div to show results. Later on when we get it to our main project, we can add an icon. Right now these buttons don't have icons because we don't have jQuery mobile. But later on we will easily be able to add data-icon equals check. And we will have the check mark icon attached to the button when we get it back to our main project. In the JavaScript, in the script block right here of our custom JavaScript, if you wrote this, if you wrote the iffy like me, this is again for uh, modern development. I'm going to break those curly braces there, and all of my code will exist within the curly braces. We want to use strict mode. VAR DB. We're going to create an object called DB, database. This can be called anything you want, but in the documentation of Pouch, they often use that because it's very quick to type. This, of course, can be called Kitty Cat. Our database can be called Kitty Cat, and it'll work, but we'll go with DB. Equals new Pouch DB object. Notice the capitalization. So we're creating an instance of a database right there. We didn't give it any arguments. We could, for example, in quotes, say the name of my database, my database. We 
we've created a database. That's it. Again, we don't need a server. We don't need all the infrastructure. That creates a database. Now it's just a matter of adding data, retrieving data, updating data, all of that stuff. To see this in action, we can open up our developer's console. Let's give that a quick look. Um, let's see, does anything interesting happen from console.db? Go ahead and save it and run it. I'm running this in Chrome. Open up your developer's console. So my developer's console is saying here. I have all of this information about this database. These are all of the methods and properties and so forth. We have a database that we've created. Right now it lives in this web browser. Only this web browser can access the data from this database. You cannot share this data from this database in Firefox. It's not set up that way. We can, of course, if we had a server, save this database to a real server and then any web browser or app could access it. But the default is that it's sandboxed to this web browser. If you further want to get more information here, here in Chrome, you should see one of these tabs at the top here, Application. Under Application, we previously looked at the local storage field, where we were creating local storage objects. We have none at the moment except for that one, don't worry about it. But we're going to be looking mostly under IndexedDB. And if you look at IndexedDB, pouch my database. That's what I put in the parentheses. So any database that we create, uh, Chrome sees it internally here, and they're all prefixed by underscore pouch, underscore something, which is what I typed in JavaScript here. I said, new pouch with a name of my database. You should see then, under the index DB section, because there's different modern ways to save a web browser database, web SQL is one of them, indexed DB is another. If you then click on that, it's got a little bit of info. If you open that, then there's different ways to see the data in the database. We will often look at it by sequence. We will see then a number of the item in the database. We will see what is the unique key that identifies it. We will see the value of the data in that entry in the database. Through here we will be able to do a quick inspection of the data, refreshing, deleting, the database from the browser. We will see about deleting the database via JavaScript and so forth. I want to take a quick look over on uh, Firefox. We get similar data. Oops. Chrome didn't pick up on my error, but Firefox did. Car set. Firefox. Firefox also tells me you've got your DB object with all of these various properties, methods, and such. And Firefox has it hidden somewhere storage. So if you're curious about how Firefox can show your in your databases, you can go over to the uh, toolbar options, the gear. You'll need to view the storage um, tab. We didn't have storage. You have to activate it in options, view the storage inspector. You get a new storage tab. Just another way to look at the database. Cookies, index, local storage, session storage, index, DB. And in this current project, we have that. 
version 7, etc. Further deeper there. Again, by sequence, other bits of data. No data in the database, but we've got a database. This database, even though they've got the same name, are technically different. Whatever I save in Firefox in this database will not automatically then show up in the Chrome one. They're separate sandboxes. They don't share the data, even with the exact same name. Okay, back to our code here. Now, what we've done here... Question? You didn't see it. Okay, let's check that out. There. Here's my code so far. Thank you. 
Okay, so what we've got here is we've created a database and we've put the database in this variable basically. Now we're going to need to be a little bit more ro ro robust in the future in that thinking further ahead eventually, we'll do this now, but eventually this will make more sense in that eventually if the user chooses to delete the whole database, we would need to recreate a new database. So this creates a database at this point, and later on, down the line, if a user deletes it, there's no way to recreate the database. So let's rewrite our code a little bit here to make it more portable in that we can um, reuse our code later. Let's break that to separate lines. And we'll say simply var db. We're not going to say what is in that variable at this point. Instead, we're going to write a function. We'll call this init for initialize db. We're going to initialize the database. Whenever we want to recreate the database, we're going to make that action be a named function that we can call it to initialize the database whenever we want. So in that, we will have the new db directive. Um, db db equals new db new pouch db in there. So here we're creating some object we haven't said what it is yet. Here we're saying that the, the db object will be the instance of the database. And just to show you something here, we'll call the database itself mySDCE. The, the real name of the database that I wanted is mySDCE. At the end of that line, next line, return db. Create, create the database um, or if the database already exists, use the database. So the new here will let us create a brand new database that does not exist or reuse a database of that name that does exist. Return that result so that we can further use the database throughout the project. Here then, um, any changes may have stayed inside of the function, so we're going to return that as a result. And then after the function declaration, we will run the function. We will say initialize the database. So a few more steps that does exactly what we had before. But this sets ourselves, sets ourselves up for us to initialize a database whenever we need to. In the event, for example, of the user wanting to completely reset the app, delete the database and start all over, we will need to reinitialize the, the database. Save it and run it. Check your console, but more importantly, check the database inspector of your web browser. I'm running it in uh, Chrome, and I'm seeing my console, same as before, but now if I look inside of 
application index db i have two i have my database which we created a moment ago and i have my stce they're both empty databases but each one of them then has those sizes and those limits that the frequently asked question said i can create multiple ones of these databases but in a regular database, I have, what was the range, like 25 megabytes to 250 megabytes? That's still a lot of data if it's just text-based data. It's okay that this is going to hang around here. We can delete that database itself. Um, don't worry about it just yet, but just be aware that every time we do... new pouch db it'll create a new database in your web browser in your device when we get it to the device any questions so far what we need to do next is make that button active make that button clickable so VAR, now this is this is already on this is on line 33. This is this is um, outside of any function. I'm still in the anonymous function. Make sure you're not past the anonymous function, but I'm outside of the init db function. And we will say here. We want to create a JavaScript object, a reference to the BTN save. And I want to, I want to make that button do something via JavaScript. We're going to create a reference to that HTML element through jQuery. So, the convention often is if I'm creating some sort of element for a button. Don't write this yet. But if I'm creating an element for a button. And then I'm using the classic document.getElementById. I would write it something like that. If I were using jQuery, the convention often is to write a dollar symbol in front of the variable name and then use jQuery to reference the object in the HTML. So both of these would be equivalent. Both of these would be equivalent. This is the plain old plain vanilla JavaScript way. We've seen this document target element, etc. And it's an element in JavaScript. We use jQuery to reference the objects. And it's common practice to put a dollar symbol in front. It is a valid character to use. So we will do that. I'm going to create a variable. Dollar. This is this is a variable based on a JavaScript selection. El btn save element button save equal to dollar. This is the jQuery the jQuery selector. That's the official term. The jQuery object in quotes pound btn save. Don't forget that pound symbol there. When we were using document.getElementById, we did not have to use the pound symbol because we're saying get element by ID. So we didn't need the pound symbol. Here, the jQuery selector, we have to be very specific in the quotes, which is the pound symbol. So here we've got a reference to that element. While we're here, let's also create a reference over to that, uh, to that div. Uh, so I shouldn't have done semicolon there yet because I need another another one uh, dollar l div show notice my spelling you can spell them however you want of course but the way I like to do it is like that in that the camel caps are there and because I've got a little prefix here that's the second word so caps show We've also got that reset button 
we might do something with reset, so we'll use that one as well. Uh, we'll put it in this order. EL BTN reset. In this, at this point, the the order doesn't matter, but logically, this is the order of things. Well, actually, my reset button is first up there, isn't it? But that's fine. And I've got uh, JavaScript objects created via jQuery so I can create event handlers and all of that. Next line. So again, I uh, kind of <coughs> went back and forth. Uh, make sure your ending lines are like mine here. Because right, we're using the var keyword to define one var, comma, another var, comma, another var, and then end of line. I'm going to say um, lbtn save dot on method. This is, this is jQuery. Previously, when we did a little bit of button pressing, we had variable dot on click equals function. That's the plain vanilla JavaScript way. Here with jQuery, that's equivalent. In the parentheses, in quotes, click. In the event of a click of that object, comma, run a function, which will be fn to prefix our functions, save class. jQuery, if we're doing it this way without having to pass any arguments into the function, is written this way. If we did want to pass arguments into the function, we would use the parentheses and something else, but we're not needing to pass any arguments into the function, so we just reference it that way. Next line, function fn save class. This is where we're going to define what save class function does. <coughs> and for the moment, um, just uh, do a little console log. to make sure we're on the right track so far. Save it and run it. Click that Save button. You should see some console output. If we clicked. These are the codes so far. Um, I apologize. Uh, since I often uh, write this code, and I've been doing it a while, uh, I forget about the importance of comments sometimes. And we've covered kind of a lot of new things. So let's back up a little bit and to add a little bit of comments here and there just to explain what we've done. Um, let's back up line 23. At the end of that line, double slash. Uh, create an object for our DB. Function. Uh, this is function to initialize database db equals new pouch db that's actually instantiate new pouch object if you want to make this lined up and pretty you can do that uh, return the result of the database. And this function here is not that long, but we will make longer functions such as the save one 
uh, I'm going to put an ending here, end init db, just so that I can find it quickly. Call the initialization function. Create, shall, uh, create jQuery based variables of various on screen elements. Commonly use dollar for j. Bars. It's not required, but it's common to see that. So if you see other people's code, why are there dollar symbols there? That's often because they've made it firmly jQuery selection. This is uh, event handler for save button click. to save a new class. Uh, to save to save class new data. That's what we've done so far. Okay, so what we need to do, the person types stuff into those fields. We need to retrieve what the person typed into those fields. And then we need to bundle all of those things into the proper format and save it to the database. That's all going to happen inside of save, function save class. So in the save class function, we will create a a few local scope variables. Remember, local scope, a variable inside of a function, will only exist as long as we need it. It frees up its memory as soon as the function is done. So we need to retrieve what's in those fields. Question. So uh, here, based on jQuery again, we're going to create some some uh, variables to store what the person has typed. So um, dollar val. Um, CRN. What was the value of the CRN that they typed? That's equal to dollar symbol, quotes, pound, uh, field, CRN. We've got that input field on screen. I want to get its value and store it in this variable. Well, to get the actual value, what they typed, we need dot val method. That's jQuery. The dot value, the dot val method of jQuery checks what is, what has been typed, and then we're saving that into a variable. If we didn't have dot val, we put the whole object into that variable, which is too much that we need at this point. We need to comma do that also for val of uh, class, and that's dollar pound dollar quotes pound field class dot val and one more dollar val inst equal to dollar pound field inst dot val end of line Maybe space these out a little to look nice all of these Again, uh, variables storing what the user typed into 
the input inputs in the form. Next line, I'm going to create another variable. I could continue the same one here with simply comma and next here, but I want to make it kind of stand out there. This is a big one, this is a big concept. This will be var uh, class equals curly braces. What's curly braces again? JSON. So we're going to store all of this data, bundle it as one object. It's all data of a class. We can make more fields. If we made more forms, like for note or you know, campus, we wanted to save more data, we make more input fields, more references to those here, and still bundle them all together in one JSON object. So a class will store all of these three together. Break those into multiple lines. Quotes, remember we had something, colon, something. Well, what we need is underscore ID. We need that one always. Colon. Based on the CRN, the class, and the instructor, one of those needs to be unique because we're going to need to put this data into the database and pull it out. Obviously, inst is not unique. I may be teaching 10 classes, and oftentimes I do, literally, so that's not unique. Um, the, the name of the class, there may be more than one class called social media, so that's not unique. What is unique is that every single class on campus has one unique CRN number. That's that ad code that I give you. So what will differentiate this record from every other record will be the underscore ID val CRN not in quotes, because I want the value that's in that variable as the ID. In quotes, obviously, it would become a string, and then it doesn't make sense. Comma, next line, in quotes, we're going to say that another item um, is, um, uh, let's say, class C name. The, the name of the class, which is val class. And lastly, we'll say c inst class instructor val inst. That's the last item in that JSON object, so no ending comma. Yes. In the example in the upstream website, ah. he, he's even having the quotation marks. That's he true, said. and I've told them about it, and they said, help us change that on the website. So, officially, yes. On other parts of the documentation, it does use the quotes on the key. On the home page, it doesn't. And I've, and I've told him, hey, uh, your documentation shows quotes, and Jason shows quotes. Why don't you put it? He said, you know, great, that's a good idea. Please help us by going in and changing it, because it is open source, and every, you know, they want contributions and such, and I haven't gotten around to it. But yes, we do want quotes on the keys. Next line, then we'll take a break. Console.log a class. Save it and run it. Put some stuff, any valid or not valid data, into those fields. We can do the data validation later. Put some stuff into those fields, maybe real data. Click that Save button, and you should see in your console all of that data bundled as one object. It's not saving to the database yet, but hopefully all your data is bundled together. And uh, if that works, you're on the right track, and we'll, we'll take a break. Let me check mine. Save that, run it in 
Chrome, let's say class one, two, three. And then this is English class with instructor Jones. Jones. I'm gonna save. And then in the console, I get an object with the unique ID. And then in the console here, it doesn't show the quotes around the key anyway, so um, FYI. C name undefined. Oops, I must have misspelled something. C name undefined, val class, uh, dollar val class, field class. Oh, there we go. Field name, yes. Okay, so if you typed exactly what I typed, I mistyped. When we created the variable here, this is how I would troubleshoot this. I see that my output has a proper ID, a proper instructor, but an undefined name. Okay, so that's giving me a hint here. Go check line 49. On my case, line 49 is not that helpful, but it's saying, okay, my C name, class name is not working. So the way I would troubleshoot it is, if you double click val class, I'm expecting the name of the class to be put in there, C name. If you double click, it highlights it here. Okay, val class, I'm double checking, spelling is correct, capitalization looks good. Val class is made from field class. If I double click field class, I expect that to be highlighted elsewhere. It's not. Well, if I double click field inst, it does highlight back on the form. If I double click field CRN, it highlights in the form. If I double click field class, it doesn't highlight in my form. I mistyped. I forgot what I called it, you know, two minutes later. I called it up here field name, not field class. So this should have been field name. We can leave that as val class or call that val name or whatever, but that should be enough to fix that I wasn't retrieving what I had typed into the form. Yes? I'll be there one moment. So let me check if mine works here. If it does, we'll take a quick break. So one more time. Class 1, 2, 3. This is English class with instructor campus. Save that. There we go. The CRN, the name of the class. I need to spell that properly next time. And the instructor. So if you get something like this at this point, good. 728, we'll be back at 738. I'll put my code back up. If it's not working, call me up.